Welcome to this lecture on motor development theories and principles. Um, after you complete this lecture, you should understand why it is critical for all physical therapists to understand motor development. You should know the three theories of motor development and how they influence the practice of pediatric physical therapy, and you should also understand principles of motor development. So why is it important for a physical therapist to understand normal motor development? Well, simply put, knowledge of motor development is the foundation for the practice of pediatric physical therapy. Frankly, it's really the foundation for the practice of physical therapy through the lifespan. Adult and geriatric patients were once children themselves, and experiences during childhood shaped their individual motor development. If you don't understand normal development, how can you recognize when development is not normal and may require physical therapy intervention? Understanding normal development provides us with standards for the functioning of children of various ages, and that can help guide diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment planning. Knowledge of normal development also guides us in selecting age-appropriate and developmentally appropriate functional outcomes. It can help us understand how children can and should participate in their daily lives. And it's not just understanding motor development that's important. Motor development doesn't exist in isolation. As we'll talk about later in this lecture, multiple subsystems, including neurological and biomechanical factors, as well as task requirements and the environment itself, impact motor development. Cognition, speech, fine motor skills, social emotional skills, and adaptive skills all influence a child's motor behavior and movement. So to be successful, the pediatric physical therapist needs to understand all facets of child development. This handout comes from a series of videos and handouts from the Pathways Awareness Foundation that are all about recognizing the differences between typical development and development that's not typical. So in this handout, these images show one child who, has experience, who is experiencing typical development, but the other child has cerebral palsy and so is experiencing some developmental delays. Just looking at these images, do you know which child is typical and which child has cerebral palsy and is demonstrating atypical development? If so, how can you tell the difference? What do you see? And how can we provide quality services to the little boy on the right, the boy who is experiencing some motor impairments, if we are unclear on how his development looks different from typical development or the little boy on the left? This example really underscores kind of the importance of understanding normal development for the pediatric physical therapist. So as you continue to learn about typical motor development, I want to you to think about what you already know about motor development in children. Some of you may have your own children. You may have a close family member or friend with a young child. Um, so you may have some personal knowledge of child development, some up-close experience. Some of you may have experience working with children. Perhaps you've worked in a daycare setting um, or in a school setting. Maybe you've been in pediatric clinical experiences or observations. Maybe you have taken courses in child development. And there are some of you who maybe have little to no experience with children whatsoever, and all of this information is completely new for you. Combine your experience, if any, from the readings and lectures that you'll do about normal development and think about what you already know about child development. How predictable is development anyway? Do all children follow the same developmental trajectory? Are there general rules and trends that we see in all normal development? And what is it that really drives motor development? What is it that makes children achieve those milestones? Are we genetically programmed to follow a certain developmental progression, or do our environment and experiences have a greater influence? This kind of brings us back to the age-old question in child development, is what has the greater influence, nature or nurture? There are three primary theories of motor development, neural maturationist theory, cognitive theory, and dynamical systems theory. These theories are summarized really nicely in your Campbell text. So let's begin by discussing the neural maturationist theory. According to the neural maturationist theory, development is genetically predetermined and neurologically driven. Neural maturationist theory assumes that primitive reflexes are the building blocks of development, and as the central nervous system matures, voluntary movements and functional behaviors appear. 
This theory assumes a very hierarchical nature of nervous system maturation and attributes normal development to increasing corticalization of the central nervous system. According to the neural maturationist theory, development is linear and occurs in a very predictable order. This theory represents sort of the nature side of the nature versus nurture debate, as it doesn't recognize the importance of other body systems, the environment, or the task itself. The neural maturationist theory really focuses solely on the brain and the role of the central nervous system in driving development. Pediatric physical therapy was really built on the neural maturationist theory. Therapists who practiced and who continue to practice using this framework are therapists who really emphasize the examination of reflex development and motor milestones. Treatment was organized around inhibiting primary reflexes and facilitating riding and equilibrium reactions. It was of great importance to ensure that the child progressed through each stage of motor development, hitting every single motor milestone. For example, a therapist who subscribed to this theory may have believed that every child must crawl before they will walk, regardless of whether crawling was age appropriate or functional for that child. Um, it was assumed that by inhibiting primitive reflexes, facilitating writing and equilibrium reactions, and taking each child carefully through the developmental sequence with an emphasis on quality of movement, that functional outcomes would naturally follow. This neural maturation, uh, maturationist theory continues to have a significant impact on the practice of pediatric physical therapy, but we've sort of evolved beyond um, solely looking at the brain as the driver of development, and we now know that development is driven by much more than simply maturation of the central nervous system. On the other end of the spectrum are cognitive theories of development. According to cognitive theories, the environment is the site of developmental control. Simply put, according to cognitive theory, experience drives development. Cognitive theory recognizes that early movements are based on primitive reflexes, but assumes that voluntary movements are learned as a result of the child interacting with the environment. Cognitive theories assume that motor behavior is learned through trial and error and conditioning. They also assume that nurture, also known as the environment, is the primary factor that influences development. Cognitive theories haven't really had a significant impact on the practice of pediatric physical therapy, but they did bring attention to the influence of cognition, the environment, and the task itself on motor development. So as a result, you'll see pediatric physical therapists often use a, using um, problem-solving tasks and cognitive ta activities during intervention, recognizing that motor, cognitive, and perceptual development are all intertwined. And so when you see these types of interventions, you're kind of seeing the influence of cognitive theory. The most contemporary theory of motor development and the one that is most widely accepted today is the dynamical systems theory. This theory emerged in the mid-90s through the work of Esther Thielen and her colleagues. The dynamical systems theory kind of puts together the best of both worlds, nature and nurture. It recognizes both the importance of the individual and, and the environment in the development of motor skills. And it kind of places nature and nurture on a level playing field. Dynamical systems theory assumes that development of a motor pattern depends on a combination of mechanical, neurologic, cognitive, and perceptual factors, in addition to environmental contributions. So according to this theory, neural maturation is really equal to other structures and processes that influence development, including the environment. In other words, the environment is as important as the individual. According to dynamical systems theory, movements are self-organizing. In other words, individual subsystems come together behaving collectively in an ordered way. There is no need for a higher center, the central nervous system, to issue instructions or commands in order to achieve movement. According to dynamical systems theory, movements emerge as a result of interactions between sensory motor, mechanical, cognitive, and task variables. So for example, let's take a look at this little guy walking outdoors at the park. Looking at this movement from a dynamical systems perspective, we can discuss the eight subsystems that have been proposed to be involved in development of infant locomotion. Pattern generation of the coordinative structure leading to reciprocal lower extremity activity. This consists primarily of alternating flexor muscle activation. 
development of reciprocal muscle activity of flexor and extensor muscles, strength of extensor muscles needed for opposing the force of gravity, changes in body size and composition, anti-gravity control of upright posture of the head and trunk, appropriate decoupling of the tight synchroni synchronization characteristic of early reciprocal lower extremity movement, such that the knee moves out of phase with the hips and ankles. Visual flow, sensitivity required to maintain posture while moving through the environment, and the ability to recognize the requirements of the task and be motivated to move toward the goal. So all of those um, eight subsystems are listed here, but really the bottom line here is that you can see that um, for in the example of the little guy that we looked at in the previous slide, that development of locomotion and the ability to be able to go from a tiny baby who's unable to stand upright and move to being that little um, one-year-old who's walking across a uneven grassy surface at the park requires a number of things to come together. So it requires the central nervous system to be able to coordinate the movement. It requires strength and range of motion. Um, it requires the baby's um, body composi composition to change. So infants are born with sort of a relatively large head and over time their body becomes larger relative to the head and that allows them to have that upright posture and movement. They have to be able to visually um, kind of see and sense the environment and they have to want to do it. So there's a variety of both body functions and structures um, and task variables that come together to make that movement possible. And if just one of those subsystems isn't um, behaving optimally, that will really um, change the entire movement. It may even make the child in in unable to achieve that movement. Applying a dynamical systems theoretical framework to pediatric practice results in a very task-oriented approach to intervention. The physical therapist will search for constraints in the subsystems. This is just another way of saying that they'll look for impairments or activity limitations that limit motor behavior and prevent participation in daily routines. So these may be things like um, decreased strength, um, spasticity, decreased range of motion, balance deficits. Once the therapist has, has identified these constraints in the subsystems, they'll create an environment that supports strengths or compensates for these weaknesses. They'll emphasize practice of the task in a meaningful and functional context and will promote exploration of a variety of movement patterns that may be appropriate for the task. So this becomes a way where um, neural maturationist theory and dynamical systems theory really start to diverge because neural maturationist theory focuses very, very heavily on quality of movement, whereas dynamical systems theory um, may lead us to focus more on getting the task accomplished whatever way is possible, even if that means compensating or providing assistance or making environmental changes. Finally, the therapist searches for what we call control parameters that may be manipulated by intervention. So again, going back to thinking about those constraints in the subsystems, decreased strength, decreased balance, decreased range of motion, physical therapists are going to search for control parameters, things we can do to increase strength, increase balance, increase, improve range of motion. So you can really see as we sort of talk through this that using the dynamical systems theory as a theoretical framework for practice, the physical therapist assesses and treats more than just the child. We think about the child, we think about the environment, and we also think about the task itself. And all three of those can become targets of intervention, which really expands us beyond kind of the traditional model of only treating the child's body functions and structures. Now that we've explored motor development theories, I'd like to just focus briefly on a few other general principles of motor development that I want you to keep in mind as we continue to learn and talk about development in children both with, with and without disabilities. These principles include developmental direction, neural maturation, sensitive periods, and stages of motor development. Motor development occurs in a cephalocaudal or head-to-toe direction. 
The newborn baby learns to lift her head before she is able to control her trunk and sit independently before she is finally able to control her pelvis and legs for standing and walking. This head-to-toe development is often dictated by muscle strength, particularly extensor strength, but is also influenced by anthropometric characteristics. And I kind of hinted at this before when we talked about um, the little boy walking across the grass. Um, The amount of fat, the body fat the child has, the child's stature, as well as the relative size of the head to the body can all influence the rate at which development occurs. And in fact, one of the most difficult components of learning to walk is gaining control of the relatively large head over the base of support. Again, infants are born with a relatively large head um, and, and, you know, relatively sort of chubby um, extremities, chubby legs. And so they have to get strong enough to be able to lift those extremities. And they also um, have to grow enough so that the head is not quite so large in in relation to the body so that they're able to control their head over the base of support and stand upright and walk. Development also occurs in a proximal distal or inside out direction. Um, The child must achieve postural control or control of the core muscles of the head, neck, and trunk before she can use her hands or lower extremities in a meaningful way. This means that postural control can be a rate limiting factor in early motor development. And often distal abilities can be masked by deficiencies in postural control of the head and neck. For example, it might appear that a child or infant with poor trunk control is also unable to reach. However, when a therapist provides that child with with support, maybe by holding them or even giving them a a supportive or adaptive seat, they may see that reaching behavior emerge. The support they gave provided the child with the proximal stability needed, that strong foundation, in order to achieve that distal mobility or that reaching skill. And that effectively unmasked a skill that we thought the child never possessed. The physical therapist should never assume that individual body parts develop independently, but must understand that any movement is a um, composite and involves coordination of multiple subsystems and underlying postural control. Although the dynamical systems theory places neural maturation as equal to other structures and functions that influence development, We can't deny that the central nervous system plays a significant role in motor development. And so I really wanted to kind of um, revisit the role of neural maturation and development. There are many um, individuals that believe that dynamical systems theory doesn't give the central nervous system enough credit when it comes to motor development. Edelman's theory of neuronal group selection describes neuronal... uh, two sets of neuronal networks, those formed based on a genetic code and those formed based on experiences. So does that sound kind of familiar? It's kind of that nature versus nurture. These species typical and individual neuronal circuits form maps connected by parallel and reciprocal connections. So when faced with a motor task, the individual selects the combination of neuronal groups that allows for the production of a movement that is specific to the environmental demand and unique to the individual. Similarly, experience-dependent and experience-expectant maturation describes the development of an early species-specific primary repertoire of synaptic connections, with a secondary repertoire developing based on experiences. So again, we're talking about that, that nature, the genetic predisposition we have for central nervous development um, that then becomes layered in with, nur- with nurture or what our life experiences are. These theories, this theory of neuronal group selection and experience-dependent and experience-expectant maturation emphasize the central nervous system but recognize that nature or genetics and nurture experiences play a role in central nervous system development and maturation. These theories also give us a little bit of insight into the idea of sensitive periods. And if you start to really study child development, you'll hear a lot of discussion about sensitive periods. And it's thought that sensitive periods may be the result of experience-dependent maturation. So we know that infants and children experience an overproduction of synapses early on in development. So babies, um, brain growth occurs really rapidly in the first month and years of life, and we actually produced way more synapses than we'll ever need. And then experiences result in strengthening 
of the synapses that we use and pruning of the synapses that we don't use. And this happens in childhood based on experiences. Sometimes you hear it as kind of a use it or lose it strategy. After overproduction of the synapses, but before pruning, it's thought that the child um, may, that this may represent a sensitive period. So this is a time where the child may have the most very, uh, um, the most ability to vary their selection of a movement strategy in response to a particular task. It may be a time where um, the ability to learn a variety of movements is at, the, it's, is at a high. More research needs to be done on this. This is d definitely just a theory. But many therapists believe that interventions provided during sensitive periods or these periods of sort of instability may be more effective than interventions provided after the period of pruning when the sensitive period is over and that window of opportunity of development may have closed. So kind of a practical example of this may be, you know, when you're working with a child who is um, maybe they are a very good crawler and that crawling pattern is very set and that's their primary means of mobility. That wouldn't be a sensitive period. But suddenly, maybe they start to pull up. Maybe they start to play with crawling, with one foot up, maybe bear walking, maybe cruising, maybe starting to take a few steps. And suddenly, instead of just crawling in that same pattern, you see them exploring a variety of movement patterns to move and all of that is sort of leading towards the ability of standing and walking. And so thinking about sensitive periods, um, this might be an opportunity, a nice window of opportunity to really um, increase your and give a nice burst of physical therapy intervention to really try to help that child learn um, upright walking skills. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about stages of motor development. So we talk a lot about motor milestones in pediatric physical therapy, but these really are arbitrary descriptions of behavior. And our kind of view and our all of the motor milestone tables that we use were developed in white Western cultures. So they sort of give this um, unrealistic kind of view that development happens in this very linear, linear stepwise fashion and that also they don't really um, acknowledge the impact of cultural variations or just variations in individuals. There's nothing magical about recognizing independent sitting as a motor milestone when we rarely recognize something like pivoting on the floor and prone. Um, even though we tend to describe development as linear, and that's probably very much the way that as a new learner you may start to learn it, we really think that development tends to follow a more spiraling pattern. We often see children develop a skill, then regress to an earlier form of the behavior uh, before a new, more mature and adaptive version of that skill emerges. So this it may kind of sound familiar of these sensitive periods or periods of instability I talked to you about just a few moments ago. Periods of instability and disequilibrium then drive the developmental process. So as another example, um, based on crawling, a child may move across the floor by crawling on her belly. So kind of an army crawl, pulling forward using reciprocal arm movements. Then she begins to learn to creep on hands and knees, and she may temporarily revert to symmetric arm movements while moving forward. So moving the arms forward together instead of that reciprocal pattern that she'd been using in the army crawl. But as creeping develops, she'll start to advance now to the more efficient pattern of using re reciprocal arm movements once again. So that concludes our lecture today. I hope that you now feel like you have a little bit better of understanding of motor development, including the three theories of development, how they influence the practice of physical therapy, and some overall um, principles of motor development.